Hello, Facebook. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's another. Uh, it's time for another Ask Us Anything here uh, with Digico. Uh, I am Ryan Shelton. I'm going to be your host today, as we've done for the last couple of weeks. Um, just thank you. Welcome for joining us. As you saw from that uh, video there, just a second ago, we have some very special guests joining us today. Unfortunately, it's not Questlove, but we do have two other uh, really amazing gentlemen joining us today. Uh, so I'm going to start with the usual disclaimer. We are doing this from our houses, on our home internet, on our PCs, uh, and Macs. So uh, if something goes wrong, hang with us. We are going to try to bring that stream back right away to the same Facebook stream you're watching. Uh, if all goes wrong and it doesn't come back, check the Facebook page because we are going to have to start another stream there. So with that out of the way, I uh, just want to say thanks for joining us. Um, I am Ryan Shelton. I work with Group One Limited, who's the distributor of Digico in the U.S., uh, as well as Clang and several other uh, not noted brands. Um, I'm actually going to do a quick roundtable, introduce you to who we have with us today, and then uh, turn it over to Matt Larson for uh, kind of our special intros. Uh, so first joining us from the U.K. is Dan Page. Good evening, Ryan. Yeah, good evening. Thanks for joining us. Uh, running the controls, as always, is Kyle McMahon in Indianapolis, Indiana. N not saying hey, just just got a nod. And then uh, Matt Larson. <laughs> Matt Larson joining us from Minneapolis, just outside of that. Uh, Matt, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic, Ryan. Fantastic. Uh, so, uh, Matt, will you give a little intro and uh, just on you and then introduce our special guest? Yes, thank you everybody for joining. As Ryan said, we have two very special guests that come from two different disciplines, from the live sound as well as broadcast. We have Artless Pool Jr., front of house engineer, and Jamie Gudovich, monitor engineer for The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. What we'd like to do is spend a little time understanding a little bit what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. But before we start that out, why don't we go at first to Jamie. And Jamie, can you kind of explain a little bit about your setup? Because I, how we understand it is you actually have two Digico SD7s on the, um, in the monitor positions. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your setup? Sure. Uh, well, hello. welcome everybody. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Ryan, Dan, everybody. Uh, and thank you, Digico. This is quite fun. Um, I am at liberty to say and have the luxury of working with two SD7s. Uh, Credited to building this infrastructure is Kenny Nash, a great engineer for Jay-Z and others. So he was very much responsible for bringing in these consoles and getting clang and getting, thing up, getting things up and running and built. Um, so on the roots side, uh, uh, we have an SD7 and a clang infrastructure. And on the guest band side, we have also another SD7, uh, both on the loop. And um, what else to say? Uh, it's, it's, I would say that on the root side, we have a very intricate system that deals with uh, sharing head amps with Artless and also sharing racks with our guest band side. Um, there's a lot, a lot of inputs, <laughs> to say the least. Artless could probably mm -hmm. chime in and tell us where we're at, but we have obviously we have a Labo system as well. Um, that deals with all our line level inputs uh, that hit all our of our orange boxes scattered throughout the studio. And uh, I would say, Arliss, how many inputs would you say we have overall that hit all the orange boxes? 200? Uh, enough to fill the fiber loop uh, because yeah. we, had to actually, we actually had to add a second fiber loop for the uh, Clang right. system. Um, nice. NBC is they're really big on redundancy, especially for te for television shows. So mm -hmm. uh, we just wanted to make sure we had uh, just total redundancy everywhere, which is one of the major, which is the biggest reason why we pick XD sevens, not only for its capacity but for its redundancy, um, um, the fact that it has two engines. So uh, uh, yeah, so we have so we filled one fiber loop with all of our inputs and outputs <clears throat> and high level stuff, um, but then we had to add a second fiber loop for, for the Clang system for the outputs because we actually had to have a redundant uh, fiber loop system put in, I mean, a redundant system for uh, Clang as well. So we have actually have two Clang systems in, so. Very cool. Gotcha, so you're using, the Clang system is, is if I recall, it's on the optical loop using an orange box yes. feeding Correct. via MADI to the Clang system. Yep. And then Correct. talk a little bit about the monitor position. You actually have two desks for, for monitors, one for the house band, for the roots, Correct. and then for Correct. your touring bands, how far are those physically from each other? 
opposite ends of the spectrum. One is as far stage left as you can go in the back end under Artless's feet. And the opposite side is near Jimmy's, where Jimmy, behind the blue curtain, behind Jimmy's desk, actually, to give you perspective. Mm -hmm. I stand behind Jimmy when he does the intro for the guest artists and so forth. I'm in that back corner. And where all the guests come out from the shows, to give you perspective on that. Is it difficult at times when you're trying to get from position to position when you have so many other people on staff and guests to get uh, through? Or is there usually a pretty clear path? I try, to, I, I, I try to just fire through it all like a laser beam and just I come from underneath the stairs I walk down the hallway with all the guests and into the entrance area and I come through it through that perspective uh, the reason why I go that way is because it allows me to see the guest artists the guest musicians and everybody prior to entering the stage to make sure all the packs are on and everybody's not searching for gear and earphones and things of that nature because once I'm at the desk it's pretty much have about five minutes roughly yeah. Gotcha. Hey, Artless, do you want to talk a little bit about your setup at Front of House? Now, I, I recall you have a Quantum SD7 at Front of House with an EX007. Yes, yes. So as soon as the Quantum Engine came out, uh, uh, you guys, uh, NBC was gracious enough to uh, get me a Quantum Engine, um, actually two for the A and the B side. Um, so I have an, a Quantum 7 in front of me. I have an EX007 to my left. And... Um, Basically, I use the EX007 to uh, for extended fader usage um, because uh, in my old setup, I had three consoles uh, up there. Uh, I had to work three consoles at, at the same time. So uh, my SD7 basically replaced three consoles. Um, so uh, I had a production console, I had a guest music console, and I had a Roots Band console. I put all of that into an SD7, nice. um, and, and the way I did it is I made, you know, before the Quantum Engine, there was I think there was three layers. Mm -hmm. Each layer, each layer was in, was a console, so to speak. So mm -hmm. my first layer okay. was my production layer. My second layer is my uh, Roots Band, and my third layer was my uh, and and the third layer was uh, my guest band. Uh, so what I did uh, was basically how I I keep the roots band on the EX007. I, okay. I keep their layer up at, all during the show, um, except for uh, when we're doing a line check for the guest band. Because in the commercial break, we generally have like one commercial break, which is like five minutes, give or take, to uh, set up for the guest band and, and line check them and get ready to go. Um, because we're a live to tape format. We like to keep the flow of the show going. Um, we don't take a lot of time in between commercial breaks, but um, so I, I'll switch over to the guest band uh, and, and Jimmy likes to take a lot of uh, Q&A in that time. So I have to keep an eye on him and I have, so I keep my production layer up on the SD7. Then I keep, then as I'm also watching my, uh, the line check for the guest band, um, but then even in the interim during the show, because there are a lot of bumpers, ins and outs, uh, the roots, uh, they do a lot of uh, uh, music clips for like a, music, a lot of music intros. I also have to mix that during the show. So that's all. So those faders are always on my left hand, on my left hand. So that's pretty much how I have a setup. I also have uh, 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 probably about 10 or 12 screens up there. I don't know if it, I know you guys have been up uh, to my little area, my little corner. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I have a control system for the PA. Uh, I also have a, uh, a constellation system for the room. So not only, you know, and uh, the control system for the PA, basically, um, it uh, controls everything in the room. Like it's a mm -hmm. basically, I use QStation, the software QStation, which is a really large matrixing software system because I have to deal with, you know, uh, SA mics and director mics and all of the mixers mics, they all have to come into the studio. Um, I basically have to control all of that, make sure it gets to where it needs to be because uh, it doesn't want, they, they don't necessarily want it to go everywhere, but they just want it where they need it, where they want it. Oh. So I have that, that man, the constellation system controls the ambience in the room. So uh, mm -hmm. it's actually a, a pretty deep, uh, pretty deep setup when you think about it when you think about it like that uh, uh, yeah that's that's pretty much my setup 
Fantastic. It, it's amazing. It's amazing when you look at the size of the, of the room, how much gear you actually have in there. What was the quantity of uh, Meyer speakers you have for the Constellation system? Is that up like upwards of 200? For, well, just for, just for Constellation, I have 72 speakers. Wow. I've set just just that's just consolation. And for the PA, I have another uh, 80. That's including subs. Um, so I guess all together, I got what 150 some odd speakers to account for. Uh, that's amazing. Well, great. Well, let's do this. Let's talk a little bit about your your an average week, average day. So. What actually happens from morning to the evening uh, when you're dealing with the bands coming in as well as your own band, The Roots, in the show? What's your production day look like, Jamie and Artless? Oh, it could, it could, it could uh, vary widely. It depends on the band. The first thing we do is when we come in, our, our call is usually around 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, and the first thing we usually do is deal with the uh, guest band. So we sound check, we set them up, sound check them. Uh, and then camera block them, and that usually takes us all the way to uh, about 12 o'clock. Uh, so that, so just imagine having to do a whole concert for one song <laughs> in, in uh, three yep. hours. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, so uh, we do all of that. We don't necessarily tape it at the time. Sometimes we do, uh, but we don't. We uh, we usually just camera block and make sure you know the director's happy with the, where he wants to go. Um, and then uh, after that, we'll still strike. We'll strike our stage because we, we're in a small studio in New York City. So we can't just leave our stage up, you know, all day because we have different bits that we do in our, our uh, on the floor. Um, so then we'll either, you know, just rehearse some. Um, we'll either rehearse some some bits that we have or uh, uh, you, we usually go to lunch like around 1245 ish. And then come back, and then that's when that's when the director really just starts just chomping away at the bits, and then we'll do rehearsals with Jimmy and the band. Um, the mm -hmm. band usually comes in in the afternoon, the Roots, um, mm -hmm. to do to rehearse if they have music bits um, for the show that day. They usually come in, I don't know, around two, so mm -hmm. we're usually pretty ready for them, and you know, because it's that their setup is is constant. It's it's always there, so oh, they come gotcha. in. Yeah. So what happens and how far advanced are you getting information from the, the guest bands that are coming in? Is it pretty much last minute or planned out or how does that work? That's a Jamie question. <laughs> <laughs> um, often uh, I'm in communication with our music supervisor, uh, Keith McPhee. He's also the music supervisor for The Roots. And he's in co constant communication with the artists, production managers and tour managers, as well as the infrastructure on the show. So music producer. Uh, set designer and various back end tonight show based responsibilities um, that can I would say maybe two weeks to a week uh, depending upon the artist it's often could be the morning of that we find out mm. the roots are playing with the guest artist um, or a configuration of the roots are playing with a guest artist or the artist has scratched the band and now they're a DJ act or something. So that those last minute production type decisions will come the day of or maybe the night before. Like um, they'll some, sometimes they'll send Jamie a two track and then and when they get there, we're like, oh, yeah, we have 16 tracks. So or, <laughs> sure. right, or what they'll do is they'll send a two track and we'll listen to it. And often I'll Artless or or Lawrence will say, any chance we can get the stems? And then I'll go, okay, and <laughs> yeah. see yeah. how much communication has happened and who I may know within the camp's infrastructure. Um, coming from this touring world, we often know a lot of the engineers and mm -hmm. yeah. production managers and stuff. So we, we have direct communication with them so we can try to facilitate what they're willing to send us. Uh, and it depends. Some artists will travel with a playback rig. Uh, mm -hmm. and other artists will not and want to use the house playback rig. So back to your question, Matt, it was, I would say a week, a week and a half. What I'll do is Keith will usually send me over uh, the contact information and then I'll do an introduction email um, and just establishing a sense of communication and find out more. It's more or less a technical infrastructure of, of what we have in, specifically for Monitor World. So obviously I, I don't know when early on with Matt, when you mentioned explain my setup, but I'm running um, 
total of 10 mixes over on my guest monitor side. Sure, 1,000s. Um, I have eight wireless mixes, one guest queue, and one queue for myself. And then we could do anywhere from six to eight hardwire mixes to the stage. Um, those are stereo. Obviously, if we switched over to mono, we could change that configuration. Sure. Um, and then often that communication will happen with them as far as what they need or what they require, or what they're asking for in their normal touring package. Uh, and there'll be somewhat of a negotiation going back and forth as far as what they're asking for, what we can do for them. Um, both Artless and I coming from such an extensive touring world, we try to keep them as dead on to what they're used to. Um, from input sensitivity, head amp games tend to be a bit of a, a, another world, but we try to get them as close to it as what we can um, as far as gear is concerned. The show is very great at uh, ordering things if it's needed. So if there's a particular piece of hardware or more mixes needed and things of that nature, the show will do its best to accommodate every artist that comes on. You know, it's pretty interesting when you think about what you guys are doing there. You're really the epicenter of the entertainment industry because every band coming up or coming down is coming to a show like yours. So the ability for you guys to actually have that relationship with these touring engineers and production managers is pretty amazing. So yeah, you've got exciting. a very unique job. Um, to, just to think of all the engineers that you're going to run through, you pretty much know, I would say, everybody over a couple of years. You know all the players yeah. in the industry, don't you? Dude, I've, yeah, totally, I've totally fulfilled my, my bucket list like two or three times yeah, over. Yeah, I, like, I have goosebumps. <laughs> like the, the, fir the first metal band I've ever mixed was uh, Metallica. So <laughs> oh. <laughs> it was awesome, though. I loved it. Mm -hmm. I, I absolutely enjoyed it. <laughs> but, first, but it, the first it, concert it, I ever went to. Oh, every, yeah, but every artist you could think of, like we, we, they come through the show. And uh, I think that's one of the joys of, of the job is, you know, uh, I love music, so uh, you know you get to see so many different acts, and you get to experience them and sort of see the inner workings of their song. You know, even if for a brief moment, even though it's one song, so mm -hmm. it's pretty cool. Along with Metallica, do you have any? This is a question for each one of you. Is there a special artist that came in that blew you away that you did not have any understanding of who that artist was, or the how great they actually were, or is there somebody that comes to your mind? I would say, from my perspective, um, you quickly, it, it's, you can see why certain individuals are very successful, what their mm -hmm. work ethic is, how, how refined their talent is, their work ethic. Um, and most often the teams that come with them, there are a few mm -hmm. that aren't uh, as structured, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. And as you know, in the touring industry, crews often change, so we know when a new crew has been added to a camp or we, we know who the anchors are in the team and who's new in the team. So often mm -hmm. what we do is while the show's there and everything's happening and there's so many moving parts with lighting and set design and so forth, we have to find the key people who really know how to make the decisions or what decision is essential for the show's best, per, show's best performance and getting that information and helping stitch it all together is a big part of, bringing the show to life because you, as you can imagine we probably you know this is somewhat of a i guess tv has become videos if you will a lot of artists mm -hmm. now are coming into shows and they're making videos they're they're mm -hmm. making live music videos and they come in with these wishes of sets and things that they want to do and 16 piece bands and things of that nature and as you can imagine we have we, we're line checking in an hour Maybe mm -hmm. 45 mm -hmm. minutes. We're tapping, so there's we have our great te uh, production team. So Artie Among and Matt Matt uh, Ray, who are on the floor patching, and Corey Reeves, who's also on the floor patching. We have three A twos who are on the floor patching and putting the input list together, and getting that stage ready. Uh, on the back side of that, I'm dealing with a guest engineer or playback, and sometimes techs with getting. The infrastructure of the console set up. Um, I don't. I typically don't start my file until 9:15 in the morning, uh, mm -hmm. because we're just so busy and there's so much time. There's really not much time. We we leave at 7 p.m. We're so exhausted by the end of the day. We get in at 9 a.m. We start from we start from scratch every day with a new artist, yeah. and every day it's 
12 mixes, 15 mixes, 13 mixes, 16 mixes. I mean, it's literally, a, I, I want to say, a festival-style production every day. Every day. Uh, and, wow. uh, I, I have, yeah, I there's, have a, there's a lot deep, of things to pitch together. Yeah, I have a pretty deep presets folder. I'll, I'll just share <laughs> that. My presets folder is really deep. Like, I, uh, you know. Do you, do you have a favorite artist or art list? Ooh. Hmm. Uh, it won't hold you accountable if you don't name them. <laughs> man, I don't know, man. Like, there's been so many great artists. Like, it, it cause, cause the weird thing oh, is, so you know, I know for me, I've been with the Roots for 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. And not only do we do shows for ourselves, but we do, you know, these jam sessions and we do these, um, you know, Roots and Friends shows where we'll, we'll, they'll invite multiple people so i've worked with so many people you know even before i got on the show you know what i mean to where it's just it's hard man um i feel like i my favorite artist right now honestly is uh moonchild um i actually eq uh my pa to one of their songs mm -hmm. um okay. uh but they're uh, uh I, one of my favorite another one of my favorite artists is uh uh thundercat Robert Glasper, um, those are people I listen to on a regular basis. You know, I just happen to know them as well, just for, from being, you know, again just from touring. But you know, they're just amazing artists in their own right. Yeah, that's great. Well, let's let's rewind a little bit to and unpack this. Jamie, talk a little bit about your background and what got hmm. you to the job of the Tonight Show. Okay. You want to start Tonight Show back or early on, early age? Uh, you can start just, you know, just, you know, last five years or two years, whatever got you into this. Uh, I've been, touring was, I, I guess, somewhat of a mistake, if you will. Maybe not. Um, <laughs> I was a recording, I was a recording engineer with a, a rap artist, a well-famed, known net rap artist. And I was just asked to come on the road and start touring. And that's when I fell in love with the process of live sound and the audience and the interaction coming from a studio environment. That was probably in 2001, I would say. Uh, and then from there, I learned the studio or I'm sorry, the touring industry, uh, really understanding how it starts and stops and how you jump from artist to artist. And I never really learned live consoles. And it was more or less just, can you mix? And I was like, yeah, sure, I can mix. Just touch a console. And you get on a desk and start making mistakes and figuring it out, reading manuals, learning along the way. Um, and then I really I really enjoyed the process and the relationship with the artists and the crews and seeing the world. So for me, it, it, it was, I was hooked very early on. Um, and then I would say what happens in our industry, as most of the viewers may or may not know, is that you build relationships with the crews and the teams in different camps. So if you're on a festival or you're on a tour or you're out there, I would say more in the festival world rather than the arena or small venue tours, you start to meet guest engineers and guest crew. And through those relationships and through that, you start to learn and gain knowledge um, through your uh, various contacts. And then from that, you then venture off into, hey, does anybody need anybody or would you be interested in going on this tour? And it tends to be somewhat very community-based where everybody's helping one another out and uh as you build your knowledge and you grow and learn the gear and so forth um i was touring with an artist for the tonight show specifically i was touring with an artist uh, brock hampton for i want to say i was probably on the road for about 10 months i didn't we went from australia to japan to europe and the tour just kept going and going and going and as the tour kept going i started to get more and more exhausted and bitter and was ready to kind of check out uh i would say the last week before the tour we were guests on the tonight show and um i've been through the tonight show with various artists before so i had a good working relationship friendship with kenny nash who is there mm -hmm. and uh i would often when they were doing when he was doing jay-z i would go sit in the rehearsals and sit next to him and watch and hang out with kenny and watch what he was doing and learn things and we would share various information. I, I'll never forget Jay-Z and Nas did a tour in Japan and Kenny was the monitor guy. And you would just, because you were on the tour and you were there, you would just sit next to him and go, well, show me what you're doing and just geek out and be so interested in the process. And over, you know, 18 or 15 years or so, you kind of just 
grow into this. Um, there was a period where I had some downtime and I started uh, teaching audio in, in, at the late famed IAR in New York City. And it was there I met, I got into TV, I met a guy who was mixing the Regis and Kelly show at the time. And he asked me if I was ever interested in TV. And uh, that's when I went and became a monitor, A2 slash monitor guy on the Regis and Kelly show for about two years, three years or so. Uh, okay. And then I started mixing broadcast uh, news, which was, you know, another sector of broadcast. And then, uh, so... And then after, after that, I came through, we were on The Tonight Show with Brock Hampton, and there was a young lady there who was going on maternity leave. Uh, her name is Holly, and she was done with The Tonight Show. Hi, Holly. Thank you. And I was so done with touring, I said, I'll, I'll be the A2. I could care less. Just get me off of touring. Like, I'm, I'm, I need a break. Uh, I wasn't looking to go out with anybody at the time, and she introduced me to Dave Powell, our tech manager. Hey, Dave. And um, from there, uh, I would say within a week, Kenny called me and said, it'd be really great to have you because you could fill in because Kenny was commuting uh, often with for, from Philadelphia. He said, it'd be really right. great to have you to help me, you know, maybe in the mornings get some stuff up and running and so forth and so on. And... Uh, I would say maybe within a week, Kenny says he was leaving as well. So it quickly went from A2, I don't care if I mix at all, to you're now going to mix, to you have two days of training, to okay, the show's yours. And <laughs> I had to look. It was two days before Thanksgiving. I had a Tuesday, a Wednesday to learn the show. And then Monday back, it was my show. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. And what are these time frames and what's going on? Kyle, like, wait a Kyle thanks for putting up Artless. I see Artless in the monitor laughing his head off in the oh, background. Boy. That's good that you put him up there. Talk about so your head like, had, boy. He was like, uh, okay, what? Wait. Clips, <laughs> manuals. Hold on. What do you next? Go. Where does this come from? Okay, sound check. Live. Line check. Are you and ready? How long is your reach? And I can't reach my other desk from here. I have to walk to the other side. Yeah. I mean, Honestly, just, that I don't mind that. I, I'm okay with that because it's almost like it change. It's like being on tour. You like you go from here part of the part of your day and then here part of your day. So it changes things up. So mm -hmm. I, I I don't mind that at all. Um, and I don't mind all the artists. I love that process. It was more just how does how does this all work when there's if there's a problem and how do you really uh, I guess really checking out everything that's on the back end of this of the facility yeah. and gotcha. just mixing monitors. Yeah. And oh, even good. just put just putting it in pers into perspective, like just think about it. You know, we basically have to put a show on. We have to get a show. We have to be show ready in and and really in an hour and a half. Uh, because sound check ready, hour and a half, show ready, get, two hours. Yeah. Because if we get in at 915, you know, we usually have to line check by 1030. We have to be line checked by 1030, 1045, because once our director hits the floor, he wants to start looking at cameras and he wants to go right into camera blocking. And once and we have that a lot of time, but once he, you know, takes over, it's it's you know, we have to we have however many runs that the artist wants to do it. If they only want to do it one time, that's all we got. If they want to do it a couple of times, then, you know, better, we're better for it. And, but and we just have and to be ready. To off, right. Artless. And to keep in mind this, you're dealing with the likes of Cher and Sting and Mariah or Justin Bieber or any artist for that matter, Brock, you know, any uh, just, just major, just major, just artists who you know want to walk in and it just be right. They just want to put their ears in, it, and and not to mind you, you know, we're rock, you know, we're in the rock and roll industry. People don't like to get up and sing at ten in the morning. Like mm -hmm. that's just yeah. not <laughs> that's not that's not fun for anyone, you know. Who, yeah. who the beauty, you know, the the beauty of it is the show has the power and the relationship and the technical back end to really warrant sound checks which is amazing because you get all these artists working out their performances on your stage whether it's melissa etheridge or stings depending upon the type of music so often there's arrangement changes there's music musical arrangement decisions sonic decisions it's all happening while we're building the show the other part to that is is that we don't allow guest artists to load files i mean that's a big part of the oh, show no 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 so no. You come in and it's you're working within my template. 
but we're helping carve and get your musicians as close to what they're used to as possible. So as you can imagine, you've got, we're virtually build each person's mix. We'll you let the guest engineer listen to a microphone and listen to some verbs and things of that nature. But as you can imagine, it's, we're, we're flying, building virtual mixes and copying and pasting and presetting different things and so forth. Just putting something together, a musician sits down and, while they're actually line checking and going through each sound kick drum, we're fine tuning the mix and drummer plays time for, I would say maybe 10 seconds to you're done with his mix. You're onto your bass player, your guitar player, your keyboard players, seven background vocalists, 17 violin players, all within. Oh yeah. Then there's that. 12 minutes. I mean, you have oh. everything under the sun going on and who wants to hear what or less of this and more or less of that. Um, and then you've got your music supervisor tapping you on your shoulder going, are you ready for, uh, Melissa Etheridge? Are you ready? Are you ready? And she's standing right here. Are you ready? And you're like, hold on. Then you're flying through making sure everybody's happy. Um, and you have a tour manager and often the artist production manager that wants to make sure that their team is right before they bring the artist to the stage. So you're juggling all of the political different pushes, if you will, to get this thing ready for 11 o'clock. Um, sure. So as, as time has gone on, I've been there about a year and a half now, um, I've learned to change some things on what I would allow guest engineers to do when coming on The Tonight Show. Uh, Digico's, it's a lot of great, amazing things within the Digico model and, and software that allows this to happen very, 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 very smoothly, quickly, and efficiently in every way. From file conversions to presets to everything you could think of we try to get into the file. <laughs> it, yeah, and it's it's so it's so important just to have uh, just to have a good workflow, and I think yeah. the cons the the, the digital consoles really cater to that for me anyway. Um, uh, just a very smooth, efficient workflow, like that's a that's like paramount because honestly, for television, like you don't want to have to worry about mixing. Like you 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 have to worry about pay attention to the PL and. And that's what a lot of people don't, you know, really realize is when I'm listening, when I'm when I'm doing a show, <clears throat> there's a difference, you know, between doing a live show and doing a TV show. Uh, I think the biggest difference is listening to a PL, um, which is basically like the comm system. Uh, I, you know, I, I have a, a, a director, a, a, a associate director. Um, I could have a tech manager. I could have my A1. I can have my music mixer. Everyone talking. They got the A2s. We have so you have so many people talking in your head, like you can't really worry about uh, mixing. You know, Ugh. like you, it, it's it's really it's really There's, it gets it gets really deep. So yeah, um, I mean, I have yeah in my yeah, world alone, as yeah. you can imagine. Let's say I have 14 musicians on stage plus an artist. I have an A2, two A2s that all have shouts to me. 14 musicians that have some form of control, whether it's a guitar, bass, or something that they need. And as you can imagine, everybody for that four seconds that they need something is the primary artist or the principal. So at each point, everybody's of this stature that needs this, that wants this, and has to perform to the best of their ability. So you have to quickly go ding, 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 and, and jump through what everybody needs as quickly as possible. Um, and then listen to the director and everybody else that's saying we got to go. How long until this is happening? So there's a lot of panning in my in my ear mix in my matrix. I have you know shouts through my matrix. I have all of my different comms in my matrix, and everything's panned. So I've I've gotten to the point now where I can, based on where it is in my perspective, I know who it is, and I know what they're asking for. Um, I've also built some ducking in that so. My A2s take priority over my directors and comms of that nature. So if my A2s need something, it's because a musician needs something, and it ducks my comms and things of that nature. So a lot of it's to try to keep the flow going. Um, I have three foot pedals on the floor, one to talk to comms, one to talk to my A2, one to talk to my uh, Pro Tools tech back, well, another, uh, four foot pedals, and another to talk to guitar techs. So I'm often jumping through foot pedals trying to t figure out who I need to talk to and when, who I need to stop and when, because... Once musicians get to the stage, they start doodling. You know, my A2 could be patching something, and the guitar player wants to play. So there's a lot of, a lot of communication that goes on, and really, it's necessary to really 
keep this thing structured. Um, gotcha. Cool. Very interesting. It's, and that's so, and that's just the morning was, time. That's not even the yeah, show. That's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's from. Yeah, so, that's from. So, rewind a little bit because we didn't get back to, 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 <laughs> to what got you to the Tonight Show. What's your background in your last few years before you got the job here? Oh, um, well, well, like I said, I've, I worked with the Roots for 20 years, and um, you know, of course, they were on the show before I they they did late night before uh, I actually joined. Uh, the show. So I was still working with the Roots doing their live shows. And uh, I uh, uh, found out that the guy that was mixing the show, Nathaniel Hare, hey, Nathaniel, um, he was he was he was uh, wanting to leave. And uh, I had already moved back out to California. I was doing TV out there and still doing the Roots. And, you know, it's funny because I told my wife, I was like, the only thing that I that would uh make me move back to new york was if i got asked to do the tonight show and uh, i got the call and uh yeah it happened so that's uh, spectacular it is it is it was it was very and and it's just like a best of both worlds because i've always wanted to you know mix television and and actually film as well um but and but i still have a love and a passion for mixing live music and that now i get to do it all at the same you know yeah. And a, and a day job. And that's, now, you know, now, you yeah. mentioned earlier that in previous conversations how Jimmy is so in tune with what's going on sonically. Ooh. Can you talk a little bit about how you deal with that and your relationship with him, as well as how in the heck can you handle mixing such a big, important room, but also listening to your shout box at the same time? And how do you actually manage that, the, the priority of who's you're listening to? Uh, well, well, Jimmy, like Jimmy, has he loves music, so he's a he's a lover of music, so he loves to hear things. He he loves to listen to music, um, so he so usually, and he's a guitar player, so usually, you know, you have a musician, they tend to like how music sounds. They tend to pay more attention, you know, than your average person than your average person to how things sound. So, uh, um, so he uh, so he really pays attention to how things sound in the studio. Um, and I think that's real, that can be a, you know, a gift and a curse at sometimes because, you know, like when things go awry, it's just like, okay, I have to make sure it's like, I have to make sure Jimmy is happy, uh, Higgins and the producers, I have to make sure they're all happy, make sure they're all hearing everything that they need to hear. Um, and that, and that, again, that goes back to my matricing system where I can have, uh, I have a specific mix just for Jimmy at his desk. I have a specific mix just for Jimmy at his monologue mark. Um, and and it sometimes it'll sound a little different than than it than the audience hears it. So I'm so I have different, you know, speaker zones that I have to mix for. Like I have a, a uh, you know, usually the mixer position, I mean the uh, producer position is a little louder, you know what I mean, than the rest of the audience. Um, mm-hmm. because again, I'm going back and forth from mixing music to mixing lives. So you kind of got to have a balance. And then, <clears throat> I mean, but that but that goes also goes into the importance of what I was saying before about just having a great workflow. Uh, it One of the biggest advantages is that I'm in the same studio with the same gear, with the same equipment and the same people every single day. So, I, you know, I've been there for four years. So I've been able to build upon, you know, just knowing what people expect. Um, knowing what people expect to hear and just being able to do that. And it's just important to have that saved in the desk. So when we do a certain bit, you know, so if we do a bit like with water, so to speak, you know, we, I know I have to treat Jimmy's mic a little differently so that he can still hear, you know, like when we do like just, there's just a, a, a lot of different bits that we do. So mm-hmm. it's just the most, Im- the most important thing is consistency. Um, um, how, how I manage the PL system um, I have everything going. I have the PL basically going into my desk, um, along with uh, some of the A2 uh, shouts that Jamie was talking about, um, and that's all going through my matrix system. But it's all I, I listen to it all in my headphones. Um, on the PL system, I'm able to change the levels of different people. So it, it, you go in order of priority. 
because the important thing is not only do I have to look at PL and listen for cues, but I also have to listen to to Jimmy, what he's doing, uh, what he's saying, because sometimes he can, you know, just not go out, not 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 be on script and just want to talk to uh, Tariq or want to talk to uh, Questlove uh, over at the guest. And I have to make sure I'm on it to put their mic up or even with Higgins, when they go back and forth, I want to make sure that you know their mics are always up in in the house because they're they're always they always need to be heard. Sure. I also I also have I also have a uh, a Maddie Dugan system too. Uh, mm. Right now right now I'm running 24 channels of uh, Maddie Dugan uh, on through the desk as well. So fantastic. Well, yeah. Cool. So that take, so that take. Go ahead. I was just going to say uh, thank you so much for that. Um, this is an Ask Us Anything, and we've had a couple of good questions come in, and I don't want to cut you guys off because I'm really enjoying this, but no, I think, I think some of these questions are actually going to tie into what you're saying. Um, one of the first ones we got was actually from uh, Nicole Poole. Um, she asked, uh, how do you decide on which equipment to use for different events? Uh, based on your uh, laughter there, do you know Nicole? Yes, that's uh, my wife, uh, <laughs> my, my rock, and my my greatest support system, who I love very dearly. Uh, how do I? I I have I have my favorites. Like I I love you know my Digico desk, so I make sure you know when I do root shows, I make sure I have an SD ten seven five, and hopefully in the near future a Quantum three thirty eight. Um, I, uh, I I have my favorite PA, you know. Uh, depending on who I'm mixing, um, K2 is my favorite PA right now. But um, just you know, just being able to just do so many live shows and and do so many different clubs and festivals and theaters, like you run into a lot of different PAs, and you know, you you tend to lean towards the ones you like and and not towards the ones you don't. Yeah, cool. <laughs> uh, Jamie, Jamie, what about you? How do you go about picking the gear? that uh, you're going to use, or do you use any outboard gear? Or what's that process like for you? Uh, Artless picks all the gear um, okay. for, the, for the root shows. Yep, that I is Artless's okay. world. Um, and so do you, have to take, things. do you have to take Artless out to dinner? Like, do you, I mean, like, how do you get, like, what you want? All the time. <laughs> uh, I do pay for some things at times. Um, <laughs> No, it's uh, so to be honest with you, this the gear and the tech side of this. Our, Paul Clemson, who was the original mm -hmm. uh, Tonight Show or late night engineer, mm -hmm. uh, he toured with the Roots for years and Artless. Mm -hmm. uh, so they've this thing. I kind of got on their carpet and I'm just riding the ride, if you will. Um, <laughs> I've, I've made some it's a pretty minor nice adjustments. It's a very nice carpet. Uh, so. <laughs> I, I was very fortunate enough to, when I started touring with The Roots, to be able to have Paul tour with us. Mm -hmm. So I was able to, and much respect and shout to Paul. Um, <laughs> so thank you for showing me the things that you do. Um, you came to the fullest. On the, on the file. So we, he, he was very gracious in saying, here's how we do things. Here's how this has been done. Here's what they're used to. Um, mm -hmm. I've learned in my time that why rock the boat? and don't change anything mm -hmm. that already works. Yeah. So with with that, I came in and then pretty much mixed, I would say six, seven months or so as the file and as the show was. And then from there, slowly started to feel more comfortable with making adjustments that my ear was specific to or that I thought the guys would hear. Um, mm -hmm. I went to school with Mark Kelly, bass player for The Roots, so I had somewhat of a relationship with Mark. Uh, I knew James from previous world of producing and things of that nature as well as quest love a little bit too so i think over time you get some rapport with the each musician and then you start to see what you can and cannot do or should and shouldn't do mm -hmm. um so with respect to the sonics of it i stayed pretty clear from it i would add i added a few uh belt packs and things of that nature just to speed up our root sound checks when we're touring mm -hmm. uh for guest audio companies or backline companies, uh, getting them some belt packs and things of that nature. Cool. Uh, I think, yeah, I don't, we, we really haven't changed much. I don't know. Just added a few things here and there. Nope. nope. Awesome. 
Awesome. Hey, um, I think this is back to you, uh, Artless. Uh, we had uh, Mark Mullencup ask the question, um, and this sounds like more like a mixing philosophy question to me. Uh, he says, when mixing the band, uh, do you focus more on reducing the inputs that are too loud or boosting what is missing in the mix? So do you have a specific approach you take in general, or are you uh, just just going too fast to even think about it these days? Um, well, well, honestly, it's it I, for me. It starts with gain structure. What I do on the Tonight Show is when I come across a band that I've never heard of, um, we usually get the music beforehand. So I'll listen to the track that they're gonna play, and I basically just try to uh, get as close to that as possible. You know, okay. unless a guest engineer comes and says, "Hey, you know, uh, can you boost this a little more? Take this a little less?" But for the most part. Um, I've, I've learned over the years to mix with my ears, um, and not necessarily with, uh, meters. Visually, what yeah. you're seeing. Yeah. Front of you. Like, cause, yeah. cause you know, I like to, I like to hear music. I like to, if, if I see it on stage, I'd like to hear it in, at some point. It mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily have to be an even level of loudness, but sure. you know, just, you know, you know, you know, the, the type of music you're mixing, you know, you kind of get to get the gist. You know, like R&B, like there's a lot of melodic stuff going on. That way, that means a lot of the keys are doing stuff. So you want to, you know, have those in the mix pretty good. You know, mm -hmm. like you can't you can't deny that that click kick drum in in a in a a metal band like and the guitars and then you have the not only you know one guitar you have maybe three four guitars and they are all playing different uh, frequency ranges. So you want to put those in a position. So. Um, I, I to to for the simple answer is you know I just use my ears and and mm -hmm. if I hear something poke out yeah I pull it back if I don't mm -hmm. hear something enough I push it up. Well, what I was hearing you say, which is uh, I think a great thing really, uh, is you're saying that you are getting to listen to the artist uh, at least that day or two or or so before you mix them. So you're kind of it sounds like you're getting yourself in the mindset of not only that art that genre but of that artist as well. Um, kind of analyzing what makes them them right, right. is it well, super vocal forward is it like you said leading with the different instruments so yeah it's awesome yeah very cool yeah. um so we had another question uh that yeah, you think you kind of answered already um but we'll just make sure to cover it uh dennis satria was asking uh when a guest artist uh sing with the roots um do you uh, or do they bring their front of house and monitor engineer and then how do you work with them how do you divide work with them etc um, so you guys have kind of touched on this a little bit already, and I know Artless, you just mentioned that um, uh, you'll look for input from that guest engineer uh, as well when you're mixing. But do do the guest engineers actually get to touch anything on the show for you or Jamie? No, because it's a union house. No. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And and then honestly, like uh, the room, my room, it's a, it's a different beast. Like, you know, most people have like, there's certain game structures that they're used to, you mm -hmm. know, that they like that, that they're starting points. And it's not necessarily that for the room and for the system that I mix on. So if you're used to using head amps and you come in and you're, and I'm on a Maddie stream, the game structure is going to be a little different, mm -hmm. you know? So, uh, uh, we, I just try to keep things consistent as consistent as possible. Um, um, usually I, I ask that, you know, when guest engineers come up, I'll be like, hey, just take a listen to what I'm doing. And if you hear anything that's that's wrong or that you'd like to change, I, I have no problem, you know, doing what you need. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you want to hear a little more of that guitar for this one part, absolutely. Please tell me by, by every means. Um, mm -hmm. But no. But as far as like actually getting on the desk and physically mixing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. That's that's not something that we do on the show. Okay. And uh, Jamie, you were mentioning uh, this a little bit earlier, just to kind of working with those monitor engineers for the artists as well. You were saying that, um, that you know, you guys are, you know, listening to the mixes, you're, they're helping you build the mix, uh, kind of take what they're used to. Um, same, same process for you, I'd imagine, um, no, or similar process? Actually, or No, it's actually no? the opposite. <laughs> okay. It's actually completely different not to... Uh, I think That's fine. I don't have I don't have a room to deal with. Uh, mm -hmm. With I have what Artless gives me and what the room is doing, uh, depending upon if it's a wedge mix or ear mix. But more often than not, it's an ear mix. Mm -hmm. So artists want to hear what they hear on tour, minus what the room's doing. So it's they're very 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 specific as to how they want this thing to sound. 
reverb tails, room, proximity, mm -hmm. everything you could imagine. Um, mm -hmm. And like Artless mentioned, we're a union house, so technically you cannot touch the console. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say that that is probably one of the biggest email back and forths I deal with every day with each <laughs> guest artist. Sure. Um, or guest musician or guest engineer for that matter. Um, I will say that you, we're in the same boat often, so we're of like minds where we want the best for our client and we want the best for our artist because ultimately the performance, if the lead vocalist and the musicians and the music director and everyone's happy, you're going to get the greatest performance yes. from that artist on the show. Mm -hmm. So I take a different approach. Um, if you ask a lot via email, then more mm -hmm. often than not, you will get less and less from me at the console. <laughs> That's just, you know, my attitude is let me assess what you can do and what you know and, mm -hmm. and how savvy you are in the world of Digigo mm -hmm. and how the system is built. And the reason why this is is that there's somewhat of a workflow. It has nothing to do with me being territorial over the console. It's if the show doesn't flow properly – and I can't get to the different layers or things that I need to get to, whether it's – and I'll explain why this is um, – as fast as I need it to because everyone else is asking for it. And I've mm -hmm. let you load a preset or load a file, which you can't. But if I've allowed you to customize the desk to what your specifics are, it has a, a domino effect that's just mm – -hmm. I've tried it once and it was really, really – I was – it was really difficult. Um, the reason Edward. being is that – Go ahead. Go ahead, Arliss. The reason being is that you have, um, leading up to the guest performance, you have Jimmy and you have the Roots mix happening. So that's on my other SD7 on the opposite side. And I have an output via um, my con send and receive from that console feeding over to my SD7 on the opposite side. And when I leave that position to then start the guest performance, there's a lot of control that I have on the guest bang sd7 that is controlling the roots outputs and their mixes on that side so if for any reason any of that stuff has been messed up or things aren't right or jimmy's some output has changed or you just you would ruin the whole show with the talent on deck whether it's yeah. macro or some something built in somewhere or it, it can just it's, be really bad it's a really cas quick. it's a cascading issue right right whatever right. whatever they add into it one small change ripples down and can so, and, and we're, right. we're we're forgetting the most important part, which is the the broadcast mix. Like we yeah. uh, we have That's an amazing everything. broadcast mixer, uh, Lawrence Manchester, who's up in a who's up in a tiny studio on on. He's actually on the seventh floor, you know, okay. far away from the studio, and and you know he has to put a he has to put a mix together. He has to make I have to make sure I'm out of the way of him. Um, Make mm -hmm. sure I'm not getting in his way with with what he has to do, um, because honestly, like I'm mixing for the studio audience, which is 226 people. Um, mm -hmm. He's mixing for millions. Mm -hmm. So like it's, you know, when it comes and I'm to mixing you know, for the artist. So and, and you're and, and Jamie's it's mixing a, for the artist. So it's kind of it's kind of like we have a, a, a we have a flow with each other. Like we like we've we've we work together every day. So we tend mm -hmm. to know each other. Um, we know, like Jamie and I, like I know Jamie's game structure right about now. Mm -hmm. You know, I know, you know how I know how he knows once, you know, we get things set, like not to move it. A guest engineer coming in might not have that mindset. So, mm -hmm. and and if he tweaks something at the wrong moment, like it can mess something up for everyone. And and yeah. you know the the worst thing for a television broadcast is feedback. So. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, well, you and then that. also it's a keep in mind our lo our line level signals, our RF is coming from Lawrence's head amp on the Lavo. Uh -huh. So yes. So any of that gain structure on our wireless RF is typically Lawrence's gain structure through Lavo back to us, and then we deal with issues like where an engineer may be used to a certain threshold on compression or a certain amount of cuts and dynamics sure. for EQ mm -hmm. based on a certain head amp. The head amps are for the studio the head amps are for what we have working for us so between that and then your input sensitivity on your sure uh belt packs and so forth everything obviously is connected so yeah often when guest artists come in they want to ask if they could change the input sensitivity on ears or adjust the head amps and it's like let's not we're not touching any of that 
Um, yeah. And we will uh, make adjustments accordingly. I, I, I do think, though, the one tricky part to understand is that artists, specifically the principals, are very much set on where that detent is on their ear pack. So mm-hmm. the only transmitter that I would consider, and I do change often, is the lead principal artist based on where their pack is. So if they're at 12 o'clock on their ear pack and it's too low in their mix, I'm going to change the sensitivity on the transmitter mm-hmm. uh, okay. to keep them visibly comfortable. Because it very much with artists in a monitor sense, it's a, it's in a, a psychological thing. It's, yeah. Uh, so is that something you're asking? Is that something you're asking the monitor engineer where their typical position is? Yeah. So, in? right. So my day, what, what will happen is, um, Often or not, it's in in my advance. I'll tell them I'm running at minus 10 or 12 or 8. Uh, I think I'm at 10 nowadays. But um, often they'll see that, and they're happy with it more often than not. Um, there's a few, like some of the very light singers, I'll bring it up to minus 2 or minus 4, depending upon their age and where they are in, in their audio career. You'll see things that are different. Um, but, yeah, I'll ask them. And my workflow is is – a little different because I'll come in and I'll give the guest monitor engineer a guest cue pack and I'll while the stage is being patched and I'm building mixes I'll show them the input list we'll check off what looks real what's not um, often things get cut and added often but we'll try to cut off whatever we can as quickly as possible and then what we do from there is I'll give the wireless RF microphone and the guest ears to the guest engineer and I have a layer in that corner for the guest engineer and what i will do is i have the reverbs their lead vocal uh their output everything specific to that first mix and i'll let a guest engineer sit in that corner and while i'm building mixes and virtually putting stuff together on the right side of the desk i'll allow the guest engineer to listen to the mic tweak the eq slightly play with things reverb sends and things of that nature and kind of help them get closer because ultimately what happens is as you start off you have X amount of time, and as it gets closer and closer to the sound check time, you have less and less time, and often that's when most of the time is put into the guest's mic and those necessary details. So I try to get them out of the way, get them comfortable, get them happy, and then build everything else underneath it and around it. So I start there with the guest engineer. Yeah, no, and, it makes sense. And playback, and, and yeah. playback and text, because I have that yeah. world and responsibility as well. Awesome. Um, Great. Uh, real quick, I'm just going to jump off to uh, Kenny Nash. He has sent in a couple of questions. <laughs> oh, and, I, know, I think, I think he's uh, looking out for you. Uh, so yeah, put the beer uh, feature back up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> put that so, up. Uh, that's right. Uh, so Kenny asked, um, can you guys talk about the relationship between all the engineers having different needs in a short time? Uh, for when Jimmy does a music skit or a skit with sound effects, monitors, uh, front of house, record, broadcast. Uh, artless. Can you talk a little bit about that? I think you alluded to this earlier, but just taking us through a little bit of what, what that is. Um, uh, yeah, like I got to make sure Jimmy hears what he wants to hear. Like that's mm-hmm. pretty much that's pretty much it. Like sometimes like but but it's a tightrope for me because now I have I have, you know, and another uh, my my a one to account for I, at, who does the who mixes the production part of the show. Um, Fred Zeller, who's a who's an amazing A1 and uh, engineer, uh, he mixes the production part of the show. Um, I have to make sure the studio is not too loud for him um, mm-hmm. because it'll tank out his mix, and that means mm-hmm. he has to go back and stay later and fix things, and you know does do his magic that he he does so wonderfully every night. Um, so I my my goal is always to, as the PA mixer in the house, is to stay out of the the A1 engineer's way. Um, mm-hmm. But but still, at the same time, ha- uh, make sure Jimmy's happy with the way it sounds, make sure Higgins happy, make sure the, re- the producers are happy, and then make sure the audience hears everything that they need to hear to enjoy yeah. the show as well. Yeah, and so they're getting the reaction <laughs> as well, yeah. right? Because if, yeah. if they don't laugh at something in the skit, then... Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, that makes sense. Uh, Kenny had another question. Uh, can you discuss what happens when the Roots have to perform along with the guest band at the same time? Now, uh, I think, Jamie, you actually mentioned earlier that the Roots uh, uses Clang. 
can you talk a little bit about that, what that is, how they use it? Um, Kenny and, should just call. <laughs> can, oh, sure. Just Kenny, Skype, Skype yeah, and Kenny. just had Kenny on here, man. Well, uh, why sure aren't you great. calling, sir? This is, <laughs> this is Kenny's doing. Um, <laughs> I just watched the colorful screen. Uh, <laughs> I'll be, I'll be honest with you. I haven't really touched it much since Kenny left. <laughs> okay. So um, were you, you weren't there when they moved over to Clang, right? No. This was, Okay. So they were already on that Kenny. before you came. So uh, yeah. for everybody who's not aware, and I'll just tell you what I know, and you can correct me uh, where I'm at, uh, where I'm wrong, Jamie, but um, the musicians actually have wired iPads. Is that correct? Yes. Oh, hey, uh, Kyle, <laughs> can you put up Matt Larson's? You can put him up. There we go. So we got... Uh, we got Kenny. Unfortunately, can we hear him? Hey, hey Kenny. Hey. We're a little delay there, so we better Oh, uh, All right. Hey! hey man. <laughs> we got him. We got him. So thank you, Kenny. <laughs> uh, such a good sport. Uh, so back to you, Jamie. Uh, so the band using Clang, they have wired iPads. Um, I believe, right? So that's wired Ethernet control is providing power uh, and uh, control for that. Uh, they're on uh, wireless transmitters. Are they on wired transmitters? How are they getting their audio from that? They are getting their audio through my desk, through Maddie. Okay. Directly to their. Do we to have the, our to the clang. our playing system below? Yep. And they have their iPads. They control level, and then mm -hmm. the way Kenny built it, Kenny, there mm -hmm. you go. Mm -hmm. is um, everything goes to Clang out of its mm -hmm. own. So essentially I'm sending stems to each yep. bus. Uh, okay. I'm sending a drum stem, a bass stem, a keyboard stem per position out. Mm -hmm. um, that then comes back into an input channel. Mm -hmm. And then we use a direct output out of that input channel to go to their wireless bell pass. Ah, makes sense. Makes and that's sense. how they control the overall blend of their stems or the stems respective to their mix. Okay, so how does that change when you have the roots uh, playing with, um, I don't know, a guest artist or something like that? On the opposite just side of when they move to a different position, mm -hmm. specifically, uh, what we've done is we've used and optimized the con send and receive functionality mm -hmm. within the desk. So okay. what, what we do is all the inputs are on the guest band side, on the guest band's console. Um, we load that template that Kenny so mm -hmm. graciously built. And from there, it sends an output of each person's individual mix out of the consend to the input channel strip that was on the other Roots house bands console side into that input channel strip and out of direct output to their same belt pack. The idea behind that is they don't have to switch belt packs or take off yeah. the belt packs. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, so, they, so they walk over, sit down. We, we uh, Kenny put a macro in for each position. Mm -hmm. So each person has their merge macro, if you will. And that flips over the input to that channel strip to receive its con send from the opposite desk or the adjacent desk, if you will. That's fantastic. Pretty. It's actually oh, cool. pretty simple. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it simplifies something that seems like that would be a little bit complicated, uh, especially even just five or ten years ago. Um, we had another question uh, from Nicole Poole. Uh, she was asking you, I'm thinking this is for you, Arliss, uh, how has mixing changed over the last ten plus years? So what is what does that look like? Um, mixing is, uh, for, for me... Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, take this personally. What, it's, it, what does it honestly, look like it's, 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 I want to say it's gotten a little better. Like, I feel like the gear has gotten better, like, since we've moved more into the digital realm, um, mm -hmm. meaning have, uh, having control systems over PAs, you know, uh, just mixing uh, over AES, like, things are sounding better. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like the uh, consoles have gotten better. Um, you know, there's always been the big argument, you know, which sounds better, a analog desk or a digital desk. Uh, mm -hmm. I've mixed on both, um, and they both have their advantages and they both have their disadvantages. Mm -hmm. um, I just I just feel like for, for the day that we live in, like a digital desk for me just makes sense just because uh, I, I love being able to uh, carry basically a whole you know analog rack and on a flash drive uh because mm -hmm. i do i do use waves um bundles uh i do use wave plugins not obsessively but uh just enough to to do to get what i need done yeah. um but uh it, it it uh i feel like the the music changes the the, the mixing never really does 
like because as long as you're using your ears like you're you're mixing you're it's you're mixing what you're hearing you know what i mean like uh-huh. you're you're make you're you're making it sound like what you want it to sound like so um i don't think mixing necessarily changes the music does yeah that makes sense uh let's see here drew hurt had a question um drew. what are you guys do you know drew as well yeah you got some friends on there. Uh, so what are you guys doing to stay sharp during this COVID downtime uh, or generally? Uh, for me, I've actually been mixing more in the box. I've been doing more Pro Tools mixing. Mm. Um, you know, I have, I have a wealth of uh, uh, live shows. So I just go and just just sweeten them up, you know, because usually mm-hmm. when you when you do a live show like that's it, it's one and done. You don't you, yeah, you know, usually have sure. a chance to go back and and correct the things that you might have had a problem with or, you know, mm-hmm. like I've been taking this time to really just, you know, just get that practice in and just, you know, not only not only just remix something, but just listen to old shows that I might have enjoyed, you know, just mm-hmm. sort of rekindle that moment uh, or you know, just the memories of, cause you know, we move so fast, you know, like we do, we do so much, like, especially working at the tonight show, like you could go yeah. from band to band to band. Um, mm-hmm. That's like my day job. And, you know, on the weekends I go mix with the roots and that's when I go let my hair out and have fun. You know, I can mix at a hundred DB, you know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas in the yeah. studio, <laughs> whereas in the studio, you know, I got to kind of keep, keep a rain on it you know yep but, absolutely uh, it, it's yeah so but to answer to get back to the question yeah that's that's what i'm doing to sort of keep my mind sharp uh mixing and oh, uh, and surprising. and every now and again i'll open the offline software to sort of figure out new ways um new routing ways to do things so mm-hmm. that's another way that i do it yeah i guess i mean based on what i'm hearing from you guys your day is jam-packed from the time you show up to the time you leave. So there's probably not a lot of time to sit around and think of, is this the best way to go about doing this? Or is there a better way we can do this? It seems like, you know, it's more like our live production festival friends who are, you know, they're, well, they got to well, go. I, well, we are engineers. So we, you know, because we do have, you know, the same desk every day, we, we do come mm-hmm. across problems. We do, um, we'll go to lunch and we'll, you know, talk about things. We'll try to figure out how to, how to get things done quickly, more quickly, like, or if Jamie has a problem, or if I have a problem, I'll be like, hey, I'm sometimes like, because, it, because on the show, like, I'm more of, I'm a PA mixer, but I'm also sort of a monitor mixer as well, because mm-hmm. I, I have individual mixes that I have to account for. So there are things, there's some philosophies that I'm not necessarily, you know, thinking about that Jamie does, because he's a monitor mixer. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? I can get the philosophy. I can get a, a philosophy that I wasn't necessarily thinking about. I'll go down mm-hmm. to his position and just to see what he does and how he handles things mm-hmm. and ask him. So we do, we do, we do uh, sort of trade. I don't want to say secrets, but we do trade. You know, philosophies and try to figure out because there's just so many ways to do things in the digital realm. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? We just we try to we try to. Fi- Me personally, I like to figure out every way. So mm-hmm. if something goes wrong, you know what I mean? Like I know Absolutely. what to do. Yeah. You know, if if yeah. I may, go ahead, go ahead, Jimmy. I, I would say, from my perspective, I have the luxury of watching every engineer and what they do specific to certain vocals or certain instances. So, um, something specific to a vocal, uh, you know, there's Ariana Grande's engineer had a really amazing trick for ducking reverbs and where things were doing key inputs and so forth, and it was changing the amount of reverb that was going to her vocal. Or mm-hmm. her return as she was singing. So if she would sing low, low the, the reverb would obviously rise and vice versa. So he built something that was really intricate. So you learn a lot of tricks um, mm-hmm. and a lot of really cool ways to do things. Uh, I find myself writing stuff down often. Uh, mm-hmm. And I often, oh, that's a great little trick. Or I, I think the gentleman's name is, uh, I forget his name, excuse me, but he mixes Lizzo. Um, mm-hmm. And he had a great trick for you know RF sticks. Remember Artless, he unlocked... Yeah. He he showed us some ways around the, uh, some certain softwares of certain things that allowed us to uh, make some <laughs> yeah. things work. Because often guest artists come in with bling mics and they want to sync them, and we have sync issues or we'll have uh, you know frequency issues, and we have to really work around and get it up and running. Yeah, so right. yeah, we're in a TV studio, so uh, and yeah, and, and floor, and, so we have frequency problems, not problems, but we have frequencies everywhere in every different studio. We have our mm-hmm. own. We have such a few, you know, uh, select amount of frequencies. We only have a certain amount of frequencies we can have on at a certain time. 
Mm -hmm. Right. And to mention and to mention this, we had an RF department, uh, which was migrated into another department. Um, Mm -hmm. So what happened is we had dedicated RF guys. And then now what's happened is often we need time and there's a whole infrastructure. So we have to put a request in into a portal uh, a day or two in advance and explain what we need and why and how many frequencies we need and then allow that to come back to us via email and plug that stuff in. And often, as you can imagine, you know, bands will show up with six channels of guitar, bass, and mm-hmm. you know, microphone. Sometimes there's their own microphone or it's something they've endorsed and so forth. And we mm-hmm. have to get that up and running within an hour and a half while doing everything else <laughs> and put requests in. So it's it's a bit of a challenge at times, yeah. for sure. It- it sounds like it. Uh, I think uh, one of the last topics I want to talk about before we kind of wrap it up, uh, you guys obviously are in the studio the majority of the time, but The Tonight Show goes on location, and you guys do remotes. Um, Artless, what's what's that like for you? Um, you know, you're, you're used to mixing in the same room with the PA and your Constellation set up and everything you have. What's, what's it like getting thrown occasionally uh, into another location. Talk to us about that. Well, well, thanks to a, uh, a wonder, our wonderful uh, sound designer, um, we we tend to have the same equipment uh, mm-hmm. going into a remote. So my front of house is 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 pretty is is built pretty similarly to uh, my 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 station at at the studio. Um, yeah, that's yeah yeah. The only, the only, we we usually have a hard time finding EX 007s, but I think I think that that uh, I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, VER got one or something to that effect. So mm-hmm. hopefully, future remotes, we I will have a EX 007, which will make it the perfect situation. But I think the mm-hmm. biggest uh, oh, the biggest uh, change would be the room, yeah, like yeah. Right, like mm-hmm. right like was this, our studio. It's a it's a you know a totally sound treated room. Mm-hmm. Like multi-million dollar trout they, they, they spent a few millions uh sound treating mm-hmm. that room so um i can make it sound however i want like i go into a theater i'm at the i'm at the the behest of the theater so mm-hmm. i i have to sort of deal with that but that's where my uh touring chops come into play you know i gotta put my touring hat on this like i i think about it as a touring show you mm-hmm. know okay let and me go all- in and right. get the room and get the room the way i you know the way get the PA sounding the way I need it so it for this room. Mm-hmm. Also keep in mind though, where production thinks we're at 30 Rock. So mm-hmm. we go in and production and writers and producers are like, well, it should just work in a sense. So they're they're expecting this level of result. And Jimmy may mm-hmm. decide I'm gonna walk in the audience like we did at UT <laughs> with 300 people around me, a mule, a, a guitar, and this, and it's supposed to sound like this and artless is like i gotta make this thing work while jimmy's standing here and they just found out there's a mule with a cowbell standing behind jimmy it's and he's gotta he's gotta like figure it all out as quickly as possible while directors mm-hmm. and everybody else everything else is happening and i think this happened on air day believe it or not so yeah, yeah. why not it's, matthew it's, mcconaughey hashtag. yeah it's tv man it's all, all right, right all right you know, all right <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then Gucci Mane decides he's going to sing and perform during his interview bit with the Roots who are at guest position. So in my case, I had a Roots mix, and now all of a sudden I have Gucci Mane be performing with the Roots at their first position, and then they move to a second position for the actual performance. So automatically you have to make the SD5 and the SD7 figure out what we're going to do and what mix is going to feed what and how it's all going to work. I would that's, say probably three to five minutes before it's going to happen. So that's, that's, well, that's let, the, uh, let me throw a I was about to say that's the the con send receive again. It saves our oh, lives yeah. all the time. Great you know, <laughs> like that's why that's why I always I always think it's important to for uh, front of house and monitors at the very least to be on uh, one fiber loop. That's just mm-hmm. how I love it. No matter what show I do, be it the Roots on tour or the Tonight Show, it's important that we're all on on one fiber loop because guess what? We can always share information. We can share you know inputs and outputs on that on that loop. And and I think that's one of the greatest. Uh, solutions that we that we use that yeah. we utilize and that's the other thing that's great and that's the one more thing to mention that's great with the guest engineers really quick was that uh 
a friend of mine, Fletcher, came in with uh, Solange Knowles, and he had a few tricks up his sleeve, and he said, here, you could try this or you can try that. So that relationship is really significant on learning the gear and really understanding what you may or may not know at that time. So, mm-hmm. And I think digital I allows that to happen quickly. Very cool. I would assume it helps also the fact that you guys are doing root shows in you know in between the shows. What's it like in a given month? How often are you guys doing root shows? <laughs> Um, we we've, we've slowed down some. Um, it, at one point, we were out every weekend, you know. Mm. Um, even as, as as recently as last year, like early last year, like we would, you know, do a week of uh, Fallon shows, and then, uh, you know, we have our Fridays are dark, so we would fly out Friday, or cool. sometimes depending on where we had to go Thursday night. Uh, and in the summers, you know, summertime is festival season. Uh, in Europe and everywhere, so we would do, you know, European, like the, we would do European festivals uh, over a weekend. So, oh my goodness, you know, we do so because we have, you know, uh-oh, because we have, uh, you know, two shows to tape on Thursday. We also have then we have to tape two shows. Then we have to get that European flight, which is usually at the night time, which is Thursday night, or we'll fly Friday into the show. So we'll land Saturday morning, go straight to the festival, do the festival, go to the hotel, get a couple hours sleep, get up early oh. Sunday morning, get on oh, a flight the, to fly back to New York. Part. We and, often have and, shows on and then, Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And then do a show on Monday. Yeah, we're back yeah. back back to the day job on Monday. So that's yeah, that's that's not that's not really easy no. on the body. No. No. But it no. sure is it sure is fun. Yeah. You know? <laughs> There's, okay. not, there's nothing like a European festival PA. Like you just, uh, no, there you go. Gotta love uh, it. Real, real quick. We did have another question come in from Dennis Satria. Uh, he was asking about audience mics. Um, first thing, um, artless, uh, you have a constellation system. If I remember you saying so earlier, right? So you're yes. kind of adjusting the acoustics of the environment for the audience. Uh, that they're experiencing. Um, I assume you have pretty much nothing to do with audience mics in your uh, in your setup. I, I do not. Uh, okay. My A, my A1 Fred Zeller, he he controls and uses all of the audience mics. Okay. Um, so I have I have no control over the audience mics whatsoever. I I and as far as the constellation, um, I have presets. There's like there's so much that goes into setting up a mm-hmm. preset for a constellation system. It's like it's 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 like nothing I've ever seen before. So <laughs> I had I have I had four four or five. Well, I have about seven or eight presets um, that I have that that sometimes I use, sometimes I don't. Um, yeah. But that's it. I I push a button. You know. Mm-hmm. I, I, of course, I had to learn the system, but mm-hmm. I don't I don't mess with it too much. I don't mess yeah. I don't I don't I don't mess with any yeah. parameters or, or anything yeah. like that because it's because it's dialed in. Perfect. Makes sense. Yeah, guest engineers often want audience mics in their ear mixes, but uh, mm-hmm. they they hear that once they hear the room in the mix, they it goes away. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, that I think that answers the question, Jamie, because I was coming to you next. Um, so they don't ever really make it, is what you're telling me. Uh, They're in, in the desk. They see yeah. them. You can mm-hmm. look at them. They listen to them. Uh, it's just not the same vibe that you're they're used to in a live show or concert, right? Well, well, keep in mind. So I have Jimmy's mic open for the toss to their performance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if they're looking for that type of feedback from the audience itself, you're mm-hmm. getting that coming from the other desk, right? And from yeah. Fred Zeller and so forth. So I have that mm-hmm. leading into the show. Um, I also have the Roots mix in their ear as well for when the music's playing and when we bump in and out to that performance. Mm-hmm. So in my macro, I have some of the Amir's drum mics and cymbal mics open. So mm-hmm. that's generously in their mix but it's probably a minus 40 it's not just i pull it in toss the band kill the band and maybe i'll leave it up a little bit but if the roots tinker or something happens i'm screwing up my performance so yeah they're 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 gone yeah that makes sense i mean give them a little environment let them know what's going on i think the last thing we are going to talk about just because i think it's such an awesome thing this is actually going to be for you artless um you are in addition to all of your uh day-to-day work uh, with both The Tonight Show and with The Roots, you're executive director of, uh, for Take a Leap Foundation. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about this? Uh, what are some of the goals and why it's why, why it's there? 
Absolutely, absolutely. Mm-hmm. This is uh, Take a Leap Foundation is a, a found. Uh, a foundation that my wife and I, Nicole Poole, who sent in some great <laughs> questions, uh, founded. Um, we, we, it, it's important to us to uh, just give, get information to like underserved communities, um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and and we be that uh, uh, education, be that financial, be that you know, just information that you you don't necessarily that p- a lot of people take for granted that they just know. Um, there's a lot of people that that don't know. Like so, mm-hmm. for instance, we we just uh, completed two uh, financial wellness um, uh, panels. You know where some uh, really uh, good gentlemen uh, from uh, Morgan Stanley and Western Mutual was uh, uh, a part of that. They told you know they just taught about financial health, like how to save, how to invest. Um, mm-hmm. And just questions of that nature, like just learning about 401ks, learning about IRAs. Um, that, that's what the two workshops we just did. Um, mm-hmm. We're we're also uh, uh, about to do a, a financial well a financial wellness workshop for uh, small businesses. Um, mm-hmm. h- how to deal with uh, just things that's going on, and how to deal with you know saving, investing, and 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 dealing with you know the loans that are out there now you know, due mm-hmm. to the pandemic and, you know, how to just how to deal with things like that and to yeah. get better, get more information on that. Um, and also we, we we're one more thing we're, we're doing uh, that's coming up shortly is um, a, a production. We're doing a um, I'm sorry, a career panel. Um, and it's it, it's called, you know, uh, Careers Unlocked, where uh, it's a series of, of panels where and our first one is, has to do with live music. Um, uh Basically, we want to we want to let people know, especially like young people that are in high school and college, that there are, um, you know, just they just we just want to let them know what jobs are out there that are not necessarily widely known. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're putting on a panel on May 30th to do that. You know, just a, me and some friends, you know, it's going to get together and just just go go deep into what what's out there, what what jobs are out there, how we got started, how we did it so uh and that's a passion of mine just to sort just mentorship and just just passing on the information that i've had that i've gotten over the years you know yeah. to people that may or may not know you know uh it that's just, fantastic it, 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 it all starts with a conversation yeah absolutely well where, where can people find out more uh about uh take a leap uh we go to our website uh take a leap foundation.org that's take a leap foundation.org mm-hmm. Um, and that's where all of our events are posted. We do also do it on social media, Instagram, mm-hmm. which is uh, Take Elite Foundation, and uh, on Facebook, Take Elite Foundation. That's where we do our post our flyers and everything. But our website it has all of our information, our mission, our goals, and uh, and our events. So uh, that's check it that's out. That's fantastic. That's fantastic, Artless. Well, um, I think we can wrap it up for today. Thank you so much for everybody for tuning in, uh, for contributing, asking questions, and for hanging with us through this. Uh, special thanks to Artless and to Jamie for setting aside the time uh, joining us today. Uh, I think we had a little technical difficulty with Matt's camera. I think he's still uh, able to listen, but uh, mm-hmm. still in there. Dan, Kyle, Matt, thank you guys so much for making this all happen. Uh, and we look forward to seeing everybody again soon. Sure.